Okay, so while we're on the topic of Mars, this has been a big story in the last week. The uh, European Space Agency's mission to Mars arrived on uh, the 19th, uh, last Thursday, and it uh, actually has a couple of parts. One is, uh, let me go here, this is a graphic of the spacecraft. So this is what's called the Trace Gas Orbiter. It uh, is currently in orbit around Mars. Uh, it successfully braked into orbit on the 19th. And the other part of the mission was uh, called the Entry, Descent, and Landing Technology Demonstrator. And uh, this was Europe's uh, second attempt to, uh, to land a payload on the surface of Mars, uh, to soft land a payload. And uh, the first one was in uh, 2004, uh, just before uh, Spirit and Opportunity arrived, actually late 2003, they had the Beagle lander, which uh, apparently landed successfully, but the solar panels didn't fully deploy, and it uh, wasn't heard from again, but they have found the, the site where it landed from these high-resolution images in orbit. So, uh, back in mid-March, uh, the mission launched on a Russian proton booster, and uh, it uh, successfully cruised um, these, uh, what, six-ish, seven months uh, to get to Mars. And three days before encountering the planet, the uh, entry, descent, and landing payload uh, separated, and uh, and then uh, the, uh, on the 19th, the orbiter fired its uh, onboard engines for about uh, two hours and 20 minutes and was captured into a very elliptical orbit at Mars. Um, it's intended to look at, as the name implies, the trace gas orbiter, to look at trace gases in the, uh, in the atmosphere, in particular methane, which uh, is of great interest. Uh, it's possible if there are episodic releases of methane that that could be uh, traced to underground uh, colonies of, of bacteria, possibly, but uh, it's also possibly due to volcanism. So they're going to be examining that. Um, and at the same time, the entry, descent, and landing uh, payload had its so-called six minutes of terror where it hit the atmosphere and over the course of six minutes, it was intended to uh, slow down until it was uh, just a few uh, meters above the surface, turn off its, uh, its rocket uh, thrusters, and, and drop to the surface. Um, and here's a, a nice animation of how this was intended to work. So here's the, uh, the entry capsule hitting the atmosphere at about uh, 13,000 kilometers per hour. And so this is the standard entry technique that all of our missions have used. They have a heat shield on the, uh, the payload that protects the, the spacecraft. Just by uh, the friction of the atmosphere, that's sufficient to slow the spacecraft down to, uh, oh, a couple thousand kilometers per hour, say 1,500 or so. And then they pop a supersonic parachute at some point. There we go. And, uh, and that uh, slows it down to a couple of hundred kilometers per hour. Um, and after descending through the atmosphere, they drop the heat shield. And then the uh, the uh, payload, uh, the lander payload, um, falls away starting at about uh, two kilometers off the surface. And then it ignites its, uh, its thrusters to slow down to essentially zero, uh, just about two meters off the surface. And I should say this, this payload, it really is a technology demonstrator. It, uh, it didn't have solar panels, it was purely battery powered, and it had enough uh, onboard power uh, 
to uh, survive for somewhere between seven and ten days, they thought. Uh, there were some very simple instruments, no cameras, um, but a meteorology package, a package looking at electrostatic charges on dust particles, and, uh, um, and that was really intended to, to demonstrate that they had the proper technology to, uh, to land successfully on Mars. And so here's what was intended to happen again. Uh, what really happened is unfortunately a little bit uh, different. At about this point, um, the, it uh, jettisoned the parachute about 50 seconds too early. And, uh, and then it dropped away, the uh, rockets ignited, but they shut off after three seconds. They were intended, if they had uh, deployed properly, that it would be about 36 seconds of thrust uh, to reach the surface. Um, that didn't happen, and essentially as soon as the rockets uh, cut off, they lost the signal from the spacecraft. And uh, they had three different ways of listening to this. One was a radio telescope on the ground that just gets, it's called the carrier signal, and sort of the tone that the radio makes that says, I'm, I'm still here. And uh, they can tell by the Doppler shift in that when an event happens, like when the parachute deploys, when the heat shield pops off, because the speed, the, the velocity changes slightly. And, uh, and so that worked quite well up until they lost the signal. Um, Mars, the, the trace gas orbiter was recording uh, directly looking at, at this spacecraft, so it got a high, high data rate telemetry signal back with hundreds of channels of telemetry. So that's the real gold mine. And then the Mars uh, Express mission, the other European mission, was uh, looking at this. It got the carrier wave as well, had the same symptoms, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter as well. So. Uh, all four of them lost the uh, signal at the same time, but the, uh, the uh, analysis of the telemetry, which is going to take several more weeks likely, so far has said that this event where they dropped the parachute, it, it did happen about 50 seconds too soon, and they believe when they lost the signal, the spacecraft was still somewhere between two and four kilometers above the surface. And so when the rockets, uh, quit firing, they uh, free fell to the surface. The likely impact velocity was something like 500 kilometers per hour. So uh, the day after landing, um, I'm sorry, this is the expected landing site. And for those of you that have uh, good pattern recognition circuits, that is Endeavour Crater. So Opportunity is sitting right there. There was some hope that if they landed long, Opportunity would be able to see uh, Chaparelli, the, the European spacecraft, under its parachute in the sky. They were taking images, but they did not see anything. In fact, um, they believe that it landed more or less uh, in the center of the ellipse, a little bit short on the short side. And uh, this square is what we're seeing in the next image. <coughs> and this is a view from the, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter taken the next day. And uh, you'll notice this dark spot and this bright spot. And here's a before and after view. And uh, so it turns out that, let me back up here that this, they believe, is the parachute uh, lying on the surface, and this is the impact site for the Chaparelli uh, lander. Uh, the dimension of this, it's about 35 meters in the, the long dimension, about 25 in the short dimension. That doesn't mean it's a 35 meter hole in the ground, but it means that it hit fast enough that it disturbed the surface probably uh, spit out a lot of ejecta and uh, darken the surface. Um, 
sometime in the next week, the, uh, there'll be another overflight of Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and they'll use their high-resolution camera, which th this is six meters per pixel. The high-res camera is about 20 centimeters per pixel, so they'll get much better uh, detail on, uh, on this site. But at any rate, it, it's, it's quite clear that the, uh, the lander did not survive to the surface. Um, and just uh, one final thing is this is actually part of a, a multi-part mission. So this was the 2016 payload. In 2020, uh, they'll be launching what's called the ExoMars rover. And uh, so that was what the entry, descent, and landing demonstrator was intended to prove was some of the technologies that they will need to land this rover. And so there'll be... Uh, Lots of work going on to, to mitigate the risk of having the same thing happen um, again. But uh, yeah, the, the gold mine is they got this telemetry back. Since this was an experiment in technology, being able to say, here's what the technology did for us or didn't do for us, that is, uh, is very valuable data. So in that sense, it, it certainly was not a failure.